I'm also going to ask everyone to please mute yourself. All right, so welcome everyone. It's so nice to see you all tonight for another pop up course. Tonight's program is Representations in Paint. I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs here at PAPA. I'm so excited to see like, so many familiar faces and names on the call. It's great to see many return, returning folks, but also some new faces here too. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment before introductions to acknowledge that the land on which at least I'm speaking, so where we're virtually gathering and where PAPA is located, is are the ancestral lands of the Lenape Lenape people whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. I also wanted to start by saying a big thank you to all of our PAFA members for coming out and supporting us today and every day. I was really excited when I was looking at the registration list, but I think almost everyone who is here tonight with us are PAFA members. So thank you so much for your support. And for anyone who's interested, I am gonna, who's not a member, I'm gonna drop a link to that in the chat in a little bit. Um, but again, it's great to be here gathering with all of you. Um, some quick Zoom thoughts really quick. Um, please note that this program is being recorded and will be uploaded to PAFA's YouTube channel later this evening. And I'll be dropping a link to that in the chat as well. I'm gonna be handing everything over to our two speakers in a moment. They're gonna be in conversation, but we will have time at the end for questions. So feel free to drop things in the chat. Um, and thanks Brooke for already kicking us off in the chat. So feel free to drop thoughts questions, but know that we'll have a space at the end where we'd love to hear from all of you. And I also wanted to mention we have a few spots open, just a couple for Elizabeth Columba's group critique this Friday. So this is this program is in conjunction with a program with our continuing education department. This is an, a unique opportunity to receive feedback on your artwork from a world renowned artist over Zoom. So I'll be sharing information about that in just a moment as well. But if you're interested, if you're an artist on the call, please check that out. And so now I just wanna thank everyone once again for being here with us. Here are those links I promised. And so I, it's my pleasure now to introduce our two speakers. Elizabeth Columba is a French born artist and currently lives and works in New York City. Her paintings have been exhibi exhibited at the California African American Museum, the Balthus Grand Chalet in Switzerland, the International Biennial of Contemporary Art, Volta in New York, among many others. The Moon is My Only Luxury was the artist's first solo exhibition and catalog in New York, which opened in the spring of 2016. Her work is included in the permanent collections of the Studio Museum in Harlem um, and Princeton University. And her work is currently on view at PAFA in the Taking Space Contemporary Women Artists and the Politics of Scale exhibition. Also with us tonight is the co-curator of that aforementioned exhibition, Jody Throckmorton. Jody has been the curator, PAFA's curator of contemporary art since 2014 and oversees PAFA's contemporary art exhibitions and acquisitions. Just a few of her recent projects include Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World in 2018, Melt Carved Forge, Embodied Sculptures by Castles, and currently on view only Tony Portraits by Gilbert Stewart. So please join me in welcoming our two fantastic speakers. I'm so glad to have you with us. So Jody and Elizabeth, I'll hand it over to you too. Thank you, Abby. Thanks for putting this all together. And, and thank you all for joining us tonight and supporting us in, in what we do. We are so excited to have Elizabeth, Elizabeth with us in conversation tonight. And thank you, Elizabeth, for, for being here. We really appreciate it. And, and for doing the masterclass, which sounds incredible. Thank you for having um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we are so honored to have your work in our collection um, and in taking space um, in the exhibition, which I am going to share my screen so we can show a view of that actually, before I forget. And I'm, I'm showing you an image of, of Elizabeth's work, Writing Places from 2019 in, installed in the Taking Space exhibition next to a work by Deborah Priestley um, and on the other side, a work by Maria Barrio. And in the back, there's a, there's a lovely Elizabeth Murray. So, um, you know, I have to say that, that when Brit Dr. Brittany Webb and I, the co-curator of the project and the curator of 20th Century Art at PAFA, started talking about this exhibition, Elizabeth's work was one of the first that, that came to mind. 
Um, it's, it's a large scale watercolor, which Elizabeth has heard me uh, geek out about a lot. Uh, so, yes. you know, in, in, in all of our conversations, I seem to, to focus on that. So maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but I still find it quite exciting and extraordinary um, as, as, as a piece. And, you know, more broadly, it really, it really clues into the big theme of the show, which is how women artists are using painting, often the history of painting, to really claim space for marginalized point of view, points of view, which I think is something that, that Elizabeth's work certainly does. And we will definitely come back to writing places. But in, in, our, in, in some of the conversations that Elizabeth and I have been having, we seem to always um, miss talking about one of her most uh, probably well-known works. I don't know if you'll agree with me on that one, Elizabeth, but oops. Should have shown that before, but one of your one of your most well known works that people people know really widely from the the Posing Modernity show, um, Posing Modernity: The Black Model from Manet and Matisse to Today, and there is so much more. What what you continue to show us is there's so much more <laughs> in these histories, in these stories, in these paintings that we know so well, or we think we know we know so well. Um, and um, I'm hoping that you could talk a little bit about your research process and getting to, to this incredible painting of, of Lore. Uh, sure. Um, well, thank you everybody for showing up. It's always nice when people are showing up <laughs> when we talk. Um, and um, yes, I will, um, I'll talk a bit about Lore and the process of it. Um, I started to do um, a few years ago, be interested in um, models and black models that are posing for painters. And one of the first paintings I did was a painting called The Portrait. And uh, it was like a mise en scène of this model who now we found out that her name is Madeleine from uh, the, the, this painter and it was called The Portrait of a Negress. And the setup I wanted to do is her as a model uh, putting back her clothing because the posing session was over as the, the portrait, which is in the Louvre, is um, her topless. And it was one of the first painting that really struck me just because it was the first time I saw um, a black model in portraying this classical manner. So I, I got interested in that. And then, you know, obviously uh, we have uh, the Olympia of Manet where you see the, the one of the actor, I would say, of the of the scene. Uh, I like I, I like to use the cinema lingo to describe uh, painting sometimes. But like those two actors of the scene is you know obviously um, Victorine, who was uh, I think the, the the woman who's in, laying in front of the painting, and Laure, who is in the background, and. Most time than I mean, not, uh, the one that's taking, um, I guess, the, on the top of the marquee is Victorine because that's the Olympia. And because it was scandalous at the time that she was, you know, naked and that she was known to be a prostitute. Um, and that, you know, obviously at the time you did not paint prostitutes. So, you know, she's the one that people focus her attention on. And I felt like uh, Law was re relegated to, uh, you know, backup singer situation. And I wanted her to have, you know, to be the star of the show. So I then started on um, a painting, quite, you know, quite large. I think it's 36 by 36 inches, I think. And um, I wanted her to be set, obviously, at, 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 um, in Paris as, as if she's walking to uh, the session with Manet, like walking through the streets of Paris, the cobbled streets of Paris. And it's also an inspiration of this painting of Caillebotte, which is the rainy day in Paris, where you see this gorgeous painting with cobblestone by the, uh, you know, uh, with rain on them, and the effect was you know, quite fabulous. And but also it just put it in the same in the same time period. So I really wanted to capture something like that, and um, I wanted her to walk almost towards the viewer, as if she's including us in her, you know in her walk to the studio. And as you see, she's you know, leaning a little bit her umbrella and catches our eye and really includes her in her space and really making us part of, like, I would like to be ready to pass her in the street. So she's acknowledging us and then we acknowledging her, 
which was not the case when you know you look at the Olympia, which is not being acknowledged. And a lot, which is interesting because a lot of prints of uh, the Olympia is the way it's printed, she's almost fading in the background. And when you see it at the Musée d'Orsay, and you have actually a very good print here, um, that she's quite visible. She's not really in the background, right? You, you can see her, but in most prints, you could just, just, just fading in this dark green background. So I really wanted her to take, you know, to take the stage. Um, and so you also have details in the painting that, you know, are echoing um, Manet's painting. So you see there's a black cat um, at, uh, at the bottom, at the bottom right, you see there is what we call a John in the carriage and his carriage is, has um, the bouquet of flowers uh, in his hand that later on Law is presenting to the Olympia so it's easy to identify that she is that character. And um, there's also, I wanted to anchor it into Paris so uh, in the background, you see um, the gates of a park, and I feel like if she, because she was worried, her, her um, apartment was uh, Rue Vintimille, and I think that the way she could walk, she could walk by Parc Monceau, so this is the gate of the Parc Monceau, and uh, you, and I wanted also to see what kind of status women had at the time, and there is some sort of triangular situation between law in the foreground and you see this woman on the right side um, who I took um, was as Cora Pearl. Cora Pearl was a courtesan, for lack of a better word. Um, and she was actually from um, British uh, descent and she moved to Paris and decided that her career, she's gonna be a courtesan because it was actually a thing. It's a thing you could do. Uh, and uh, I, I chose to identify her as Cora Pearl because she had, you know, some sort of a hobby was to dye her dog the same color as a dress. So that's how you can identify her on the right side. I know it was very, it's very, it's very eccentric. Um, so there you go. And also in the background, you see a woman with two children, which symbolize, symbolizes being a nanny. And I feel that was really the triangular as a woman, what you could do at the time, your status in society was either, you know, you choose, your career was very limited. Let's say you could be a wife, right? You could be a courtesan, which again, was a thing, crazy. Or you could be a nanny. And uh, Laure was also, was a model, but also a nanny. There's all different portrayals of her, uh, from other painters and also from Manet who painted her several times as um, someone taking care of children. So, I, so at this point, I just wanted her to embody fully, you know, a woman who's working for herself, posing for an artist and um, being a part of Paris. And you see also the details. I mean, you, you see on her, her earrings are the same that in the paintings and the dress is similar to it. And the color palette is also similar to the, the to Manet, Manet's Olympia. So that's how I really try to uh, sing them together. Well, I mean, the 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 eccentric and ahead of her time in terms of dyeing her dog's fur, I guess, because it seems <laughs> like it's something that we see more and more today. I know. <laughs> for better, for worse. Uh, but I, I mean, I think you, you're, one of the things that really strikes me about your work is also, I mean, how you are talking about women and women's position historically, but also what that reveals about the contemporary moment. And certainly one of one of my favorites that that I always having enjoy having you talk a little bit about is this painting and this remarkable person um, that you really bring to brought to light to me. Listen, uh, I said it once, ten times, a thousand times. I love B.D. Mason. Yeah. I will say it again. I love B.D. Mason. So B.D. Mason, the arc of her life, I feel absolutely deserves 10,000 movies. So this woman was, you know, born and saved and uh, was born in 1818 and uh, was a midwife and was very good for, um, you know, dealing with herbs and medicine, medicinal herbs. And uh, she was an incredible asset to her master. 
so much so, so he decided to have a few kids with her, but you know, obviously it was a bit against her will, I would say, but you know, I guess that's what he did. And at some point, I think he, he was from Mormon faith, uh, he wanted to move uh, west. Um, so first, I think they moved to Utah and they crossed, they crossed the states and you can see, that's why I, I painted the map of, 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 uh, uh, of the time the, of the US. They, had, she had, they crossed the state uh, in carriage, obviously, but he made her walk behind the carriage with, her, with the kids. And so, you know, it also gives you a mindset of who this woman is already. So they, so, so they walked, they, they went to Utah, they stayed there for a while, but he decided that they're gonna move to uh, California. And, and again, BD, knowing, get, getting all the information that she could, uh, understood that California was a free state. And if you're able to stay in California for three years, you are free. So she's laying low, clearly, and she, um, but she also befriends, I think, the other, other, other two free black men. And they explain the situation, you know, better. I'm not really, I don't remember all the details, but they basically said to her, we will help you to move forward with, you know, staying here. And I think one of the men maybe fell in love with one of her daughters, something like that, where he had a lot of incentive, let's say. Um, uh, because at some point the master wanted to go back to uh, Texas um, because he wanted to sell the slaves. And he pretended and he lied. He said, oh no, if you go back to Texas, you will be free, I, I guarantee you. And of course, a bunch of lies. So she didn't believe him. And she decided, they decided, uh, she decided with her friends that it would be great to sue him. So they did, they served him and she won. Um, so he left, the master left because obviously he was defeated. She stayed. And she basically put in practice whatever she knew, which was, you know, being a midwife and you know, having help and creating some sort of medicine with all the herbs she knows. She applied what she knows and her knowledge to help others, but also to have some money. And she was able little by little to save money. And, you know, little by little, she decided, you know what, I'm just going to buy a little bit of land. And slowly but surely, she acquired more and more land, which will be today the equivalent of downtown LA. She was able to resell that land and make what the equivalent today of millions. And I think then she opened, uh, I think she opened a church or, um, and she shared a lot, of, a lot of her wealth with charities, helping others, still delivering babies, still healing people. And, uh, and I think her, one of her daughters married one of her, like some, somebody also from uh, wealth and uh, they gave back to their community tremendously so this woman is is really incredible but I can't even like the mindset that she must have from whatever she started to like with this really what we call eyes on the prize mm. she really just thought okay you know what I can, I can do it I just have to be patient, patient and just apply all the skills that I know it's it's an incredible mm. incredible mindset an incredible example Absolutely. And when did you first, this is kind of a two part question. One is thinking about, you know, how you first discovered Biddy's story, what it means um, to, to sort of translate these stories into works of art and share them with people. But all, I guess it's a three part question, excuse me. But also, what, what is the work of an artist in history and an artist in an archive, for example, you know, what can artists do that scholars and curators can't do? And I, that's a loaded question because I think there's a lot can be done and I think your work does it. Um, well, I would say, okay. So the way I found out about her, I think I was living in LA, in LA at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was helpful. And um, I was just trying to, you know, there was a lot I didn't know about, about black history just because it's not my history being French. And I was fascinated by all, I mean, the, the, the wealth of it, but how little was known about them and how little they were exposed to the world. And when I found out about her story, about B.D. Mason's story, I mean, nobody really talked about it. I think now it's more, more it's better. You see a lot about this just, I think, because of social media. So it's, it's uh, 
more spread, but at the time it was very rare. Um, so I started to study whatever I could find about her. And then, I'm, and then I also realized there's only one picture of her, one photograph of her that exists, which, you know, that's the one I used to, to actually uh, do this portrait. And I just thought with a story like that, with a background like that, I feel like she deserved, you know, like, an, an, like, a, like a portrait, like a proper portrait, a portrait that you do for royalty, a portrait you do for and any character that would, would be a marker all their time. So I think that's why I decided to, uh, to start with that and then inspired me to paint others who I felt did not have this type of imagery existing uh, for them. Um, and as an artist, I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a lot you can do. Just you can create a visual language that perhaps does not exist. Um, it doesn't obviously it's it would be a contemporary language and then it can exist in any kind of form just to make these uh, history makers um more visible for people mm. to see um, so and the idea of, and using also that way of painting her which obviously is steeped into you know dutch imagery I mean, yeah. obviously my, my, my inspiration is you know quite obvious it's vermeer and um, I think it was important to also give her this classical way of being and having this a, a very imposing but yet uh, inviting uh, posture. Uh, I think all this I really wanted to to paint something that honor her memory. Um, yeah, hopefully I did. Hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I mean your work is there's there's it's amazing when you start to go into the details how symbolic every single element of your work is from the clothes to what's around to that you were talking about the map in the background I mean it's all carefully researched and may not have all existed in one place at one time but but when you put them all together it's a it's a it enlivens the story in in other ways it's really really incredible oh thank you and one of the other things that I was thinking that you you started to talk a little about that we have had conversations about in, in private but is the you know, the fact, well, that I geek out about your watercolor technique, for example, and how incredible it is, but it is the fact that you are um, an incredibly accomplished artist in, in what are old master techniques in some case, which is rare for a contemporary artist. Um, so we've talked a little bit about that tension between contemporary art and um, sort of traditional representational painting or that that sort of traditional craft focus and and um i think that tension plays out really well in your work um but but i you know why what what has inspired you to to start doing it this way and and to stick with it in the way that you have yeah um i wanted i mean i'm i fascinated by the technique you can achieve with oil or any kind of painting anyway which which is why obviously i'm i try to do it better if i can each time right i think you never stop from learning from this medium. But also um, because using the same language as you know painters from the 17th, 18th, 19th century, it allows me to really make black bodies visible in an era where they were either represented in a certain type of way due to history and uh, allow them also to occupy a different space in people's mind, even though in reality, they did not occupy that space. I think it's important that we can shift our, a bit our psyche and see and redefine how black people are perceived. I mean, unfortunately, I'm um, great to say that, you know, in today's actuality, you see it too often what uh, the black body triggers in others. And it's, it's important to be able to use the same tropes so then you can, you can put them with others at the same level. So it's important for me to use that same language so then there's no separation, mm. basically. And um, I, I mean, it, it does take some time to, you know, I mean, I, I would never perfect that, that technique just because it's just a lot to learn about it but um one of the thing i definitely uh, dare to is to use what we call uh, 
I guess, dead, dead, the dead layer, which is in French called the grisaille, which is that black and white uh, layer where you do everything in black and white, and then you just color on top of it with layers and layers of color. So it really gives you that depth and that light that you find in, you know, an, in Vermeer painting, which is typically uh, what he did, or Ingres, or all those uh, fantastic uh, uh, work where you really feel the light is very different. It just gives you a certain depth that um, I, I do not find with painting at a, at a fresco, but you know, I mean, Rembrandt is still great, um, but it's, it's just, it's, it's a different technique, but I, I, I really like this one just because it allows me to say something else socially and politically. Mm. And, and an interesting thing to think about with painting, because there's been, you know, so many times throughout history that certain, I mean, you think about feminist artists, for example, in the 70s, how they, they were anti-painting for a while because it was considered the, the, you know, it was, the history was too deep. The patriarchal history of painting was too deep. So to see artists now and, and throughout the years to have actually taken on those tropes that you're talking about in order to, in order to be critical of that history and language is, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I want us to get to writing places a little bit um, because we haven't had too much time to talk about it yet. And it is such an incredibly powerful piece and such a big part of the Taking Space exhibition. Um, but a lot of what, I mean, you, you, when you were talking about the black body, this is an entire series about the black, black body at, at leisure that you yes. were thinking about. And if yeah. you could just talk a little, oh, yep, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a series I started of large scale watercolors, and um, hopefully it will be done one day. And it's the idea of representing black bodies the same way you would find a royal portrait or court portrait or landowner's portrait um, at leisure. And I, again, I cannot help but you know making that parallel. But there is something about today uh, black bodies in leisure that are in that can be interpreted as a threat, or as, as danger, or something uh, idle that you know he's considered abnormal, or that you have to pay attention to. And I thought it was interesting because you go to a museum or any kind of place where you see those you know gorgeous paintings. And you never question that um, you know, a scene of play, people playing cards or hunting or eating or just lay there, really, uh, is a symbol of you know, either laziness or danger or threat. It's never, never a question. So I just wanted to, you know, this, this scene to, again, take that space and make it clear that there is um, the right to inhabit these you know, luxurious spaces and existing in these spaces, rightfully so, and be unapologetically present and um, par in parallel to the same painting with uh, westernized bodies. Um, so, and also using it, for example, this one is obvious, is like, like a hunting scene. And hunt, obviously, is something, a hobby uh, that is taken by, you know, obviously, uh, royalty or any kind of very wealthy landowner. And I just, I just wanted a black body in that space and using that same kind of hobby. And, and owning everything about it. And, you know, there's, there will be others with different themes, but there's something where she's really, um, she's unapologetic. She's really taking that space and she's looking at us almost defiant. Like, this is mine. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. She has the same gaze as Lore, you know, it's like staring yeah. right at you. Yeah. And, and you know, and also, the idea that, uh, again, the, those spaces that you have behind, which are either palaces, castles, or manors, are, because of history, are 
being held in the back of the same, you know, of the of slavery. Mm. And I just, I just like the idea that the space that this they built, they can now occupy as well, right? And um, and yeah, yeah, that this is rightfully mine. <laughs> And, but in, in other studies, I also, because a few years ago, a friend of mine uh, shared this article um, from um, a British paper where they find out uh, um, some of the um, stately home, I think that, that's what they call them, um, were at the time, just after the abolition of slavery in, in, in England, uh, that the landowners claim that they suffered from uh, the abolition because they lost their plantation overseas. And they ask the government to uh, reparation, basically, which, you know, the, rep the government said, of course, you are owed reparations. Let mm -hmm. us give you some money for this. And they earn, again, the equivalent of today's money is outrageous. You know, it's, it's um, several, several millions of dollars, which, you know, they used to uh, better their places or you know, build a new kitchen, I don't know, something of that sort. And, um, and I'm using some of these establishment uh, in the background of uh, all um, these watercolors. So I think it's also add on another layer of, uh, yes, taking, taking the space and taking it back. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've always really thought of this one, especially, I mean, the, the word science fiction is exactly what I mean. Maybe fantasy. It's a, it's a fantasy yeah. category of if, if, if the story went a different way, right? If maybe she, she was the one that got control of these, these manners in that time period, or these, these home, this home in that time period, what, what the fantasy of her life would have been like then. Um, there's something very sort of alternate uh, story to it, especially right, this piece. Like an alternate universe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and it reminds me, we have we have a few minutes and I thought it would be fun for people to hear a little bit about what you are working on now and your pan, your big pandemic project, actually. I know. That <laughs> it's was, almost done. It's almost done. I'm only in revision mode now. Uh, well, my pandemic project, uh, was something I started, I wanted to do a few years ago. And uh, again, one of my, one of the things of my practice is, you know, find out about characters and put them in the forefront uh, because their history of their journey is so incredible. I feel like people need to talk about that. And I uh, found out about this character called Stephanie Sinclair. And years ago, there's a novel written about her in French by a, a writer from Martinique. Uh, and then, you know, I read it and I thought, well, I need to do a portrait of this woman. She is fantastic. But then I thought the story is so incredible. And so there's so many ups and downs that I'm like, a portrait is not enough. So I decided to do a graphic novel. And here we go. 10 million pages later, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm done with a graphic novel that I wrote with a friend of mine. And uh, we were lucky enough to have an editor in France who is so taken by the project, he's, you know, we're doing it. And I'm just gonna tell a little bit about her so to understand why she was so interesting to me. Uh, so her name is Stéphanie Sinclair. She is from Martinique and she moved uh, in the beginning of the 19th, uh, the 20th century uh, to Harlem. So you could see how it kind of echoed a bit of my life, but I think that it stays, it stops here. You will hear why, uh, because later in during her years, even though there was a lot of ups and downs, drama and tragedies, she decided that the best way for her to survive would be to become a mobster. And she decided to run what we call um, a racket number, uh, which at the time is also called the Italian lottery or something like that. And Big Mobster had, you know, a play on it. You had Dutch Schultz, you had Luke Luciano, and she decided, and you had a lot of, a uh, lot of them in Harlem. And it was very easy, not very easy, but it was a very lucrative business. And she was very, 
very successful. I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, at the time when I started the, I'm, I'm starting, you know, uh, the graphic novel time-wise, uh, I think Roosevelt is elected president, which is 1933, and he was making 75,000 a year, right? Um, she was making roughly a hundred grand a year. So she's making more than the president at the time, being a, black, a foreign black woman, which I think is incredible. And also, I mean, and you had, you know, you had a lot of them who were much more successful than, than her. I mean, somebody like Luke Luciano was making way more and Dutch Schultz, but uh, I, and I think her journey is incredible because she also started to fight for civil rights. She was buying ads in um, the Amsterdam News, which still exists today, and uh, writing ads and educating people about the rights that they had against the police. She was fighting uh, police brutality <laughs> again. And, um, and just, again, I think she was an incredible woman. Yes, she was a mobster, but she did a lot of good with uh, what she had. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and hopefully it will be released in the US uh, between, I mean, I have a big, I mean, I don't have a precise date, but I think it's between the spring and fall of 2022, let's say. Wow. Well, we'll definitely look out for that. And it seems like, you know, that's, that's the, that's what we're, your work does for me is to bring these, these historic moments, these historical stories forward to make us think about how much things have changed and how much things haven't changed actually, how much there's so much more work to do um, and what we're doing. Yeah. But I'm, I'm happy to um, take any questions that anyone has. I'll stop sharing for a minute perhaps so that we can all look at each other. Uh, but if we want to reference something, I'm happy to bring the screen back up. If anyone has any questions for Elizabeth or comments, please, please let us know. Anybody? No? Well, I, I can, I can, oh, ah, Abby's got one, sorry. Uh, oh, um, Abby's asking, do you have any studio rituals, Elizabeth? I do. I, um, I mean, I have one in particular. Um, the minute I step in my studio, I put on my coat, my paint coat, uh, because I feel like if I don't wear that coat, I'm not going to paint. But I think it just create, it creates a mental shift where I'm like, okay, now I'm the painter and um, I'm, I'm ready to get to work. So that's the, that's the first thing I do when I enter my studio. I remove my, you know, civilian coat and I put my um, painter's coat on and then I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to work. That's really, that's the one thing. That's amazing because I've seen a lot of photos of you in articles and things with that paint coat on yeah, and it does yeah. give you, that's, that's great. I didn't realize that it was a ritual. Yeah. And, and a few more um, from, from Winston Lowe, what brought you to New York City and did you receive formal training? That's a good question because your training is, is really interesting. Yeah, I did. Um, yes, I, I mean, yes and no. I don't know if I did receive, well, I went to art school where obviously you learn about different techniques and um, they open your mind to different mediums and things like that. But I feel like the way I paint to a certain degree, I learned uh, with studying old masters. I mean, it's, I, I mean, of course your teacher is telling you, I mean, they, they can indicate you how to paint, you know, in oil or watercolors. Of course, there's a way to do it, but I think the, 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 the technique, the old masters technique that I'm using, I just learned by observing all masters paintings and studying them and write everything about them and and, and read everything about them sorry and um, and going to the museum and just you know standing you know that close to them to see uh, the layers and uh, you know how come I can't see any strokes of the, of the brush and what's happening and what's the support and write down all the information I could so yeah <laughs> And so in school, just as a follow-up question, because I'm thinking about PAFA, for example, and how the students still draw from 
the cast, the plaster cast, 19th century plaster cast. I mean, is that, was it a very academic training where you went to art school or? Yeah, yeah I mean, you had also um, models posing, nudes. Um, so you can learn the mm -hmm. body, you have a different way of doing it. You had long sessions where you have, you know, they stand there for a couple of hours and you had the ones that stressed me the most uh, because obviously I'm somebody who likes the detail, but the one that was very stressful that they had to, they walk and then you have to sketch really quickly. So you understand how limbs are moving. And I was like, no, it's the most stressful way. And then you can also use uh, different techniques. So sometimes you have to use ink. Sometimes you have to use chalk, um, graphite, depending, depending on, you know, what was the mood of the teacher that day, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it just makes you, I think it was just to make you more comfortable uh, with using any kind of medium and also to see the body in a different way. So then you can see it in light and shadow and just not as just blocks because our, our mind interprets what we see. It's almost like we have a filter and we understand that this is, okay, this is an arm, so I have to painting or drawing that way. But when you start seeing things in light and shadow, it's a very different approach. And I think they were trying to teach us that with quick techniques or different mediums. And today you, you primarily use photography, right? You paint from photographs, you paint from, yeah. is that, yeah. Essentially, yeah. I take, yeah. I take pictures of models and, um, and I apply them because nobody wants to sit in my studio for like 10 <laughs> hours. <laughs> That's what I yeah. And Brooke, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Uh, Elizabeth, what it's always so great to to be with you and uh, and to hear from you. And I'm thinking a lot right now about your graphic novel. I can't wait. Um, we're definitely going to want to do a book release party. But I'm thinking a lot about this arc from your Vermeer-like painting, as you referenced it, of BC to the graphic novel of the 21st century. And that's such an extraordinary, you know, giant step and long leap. And I'm fascinated with, with that leap and wondering if there's, was there any struggle for you in doing that? Or it was like, I'm gonna do a graphic novel and I'm gonna find these partners to do it with and, and I'm excited. Or was it a challenge for you to get that mindset going, knowing the, history paintings that you've been working on so solidly for several years? Well, I, it, it was definitely a switch, but I got also my inspiration from um, Kerry James Marshall, who in the 90s actually did a graphic novel. And when I saw his um, show at the Med Boyer, there were uh, pages of his graphic novel there. And I just thought it was fascinating. And then maybe you know, a few, few years later, I read this article where he was talking about uh, the graphic novel and how he felt like it was an, you know, an art form as well. And this, his subject matter was you know, about superheroes, um, but definitely talked about uh, the, pre the, the blackness socially and what it meant. I think it was even set maybe in the 70s, maybe don't quote me on this, I'm not sure. Um, but I, was, I just thought that's, I just like his take on it. And I think it also sparked something in me to think, well, that's a possibility. It's in a different medium and a different art form to, tr to talk about a subject matter in a different way. Um, so it was, it was definitely um, a shift. And I really think that being uh, in a self quarantine for a year, more than a year, definitely gave me the room to be able to work on it because um, I didn't have access to my studio as freely uh, just because I, I didn't really want to go. Um, and, um, and being, you know, in, in a space where drawing did not take as much physical space, uh, I think it was it was meant to be that I was I had to do it this year, basically. So um, we'll see how it goes, but yeah. 
Thank you. Oh, and Anne McCollum, I see you waving your hand. I think I can ask you to unmute. There you go. Thanks, Jody. Yeah. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Um, it took the um, one of my very insightful, fr insightful friends on this call to inquire about the painting that's behind you. I can't believe that we've spent a lot of time Zooming and we've never discussed it. Is absolutely. there anything you'd like to share? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is also a painting about uh, a woman I found out about but I didn't know. And it's almost an allegorical portrait of Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, the first African-American poet to be published in, in the States. And uh, her story is extraordinary and tragic at the same time. Um, meaning that, again, she was um, born in, 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 she was born as a, as a slave. And her masters, and she was on the East Coast and the masters uh, thought she was, there was something special in her. So we decided to teach her how to read and write which at the time was extraordinary. And she um, revealed herself to be a prodigy. And, and she was incredible with words and she was a magnificent poet. And so we decided to publish her work. And um, later on, they freed her and she married uh, uh, a man who also was freed. And they started to live together and had two kids. And, if, and the unfortunately, the kids um, passed away very young. Um, and she also died very young, I think maybe in her 30s, and her husband also quite young, and um, which it's, it's a shame because then I don't think she was able to produce more work after that. I think she was not able to function in the world um, because I think she maybe she, was, she didn't feel protected or she, she was just not used to be living that way. So I think she was not able to devote any time to her, to her art uh, other than that book. But I just thought you know, it was quite fascinating. Again, another, an, another incredible character and another incredible uh, life uh, taking too early um, because I think maybe she could have graced us with more work. But yeah, that's, that's really sweetly. And that is, it think, couldn't have been a more meaningful answer. It's a beautiful painting. But I gave the friend on this call who asked the question, the book of her poetry um, last year when we went to Montgomery. Oh, um, wow. Um, so thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Smarty pants. <laughs> thank you. And, and please, yes, if anyone wants to wave their hand, we're happy to unmute you. And there is a question from Mary. I loved your video for Cinderella. Do you have any plans to explore that again? Well, I'm not really sure. I mean, if I do, um, and, and maybe I'm, just could you explain to everyone what what the video of Cinderella oh, yeah. is? Maybe oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, well, Cinderella was a commission by um, um, the Met Opera, where they um, asked artist to shoot a short movie of you know, two minutes or under um, interpreting the opera that they have now in season and still incorporate somehow uh, your personality and work. And at the time, the opera where that was shown was Cinderella, Cendrillon. And because it was a French story, I was like, of course, this is the one. And, and I really wanted to show uh, Cinderella that was not traditional. And um, my friend was able to have a, a model called Grace Ball, um, who is from Sudan originally, but she's here, but she, she lives in the States. Incredible beauty. And um, with a shaved head. And I thought for a Cinderella to be untraditional, that would be fabulous. And, you know, she was, and you know, it's what I thought was amazing that her name is Grace and she was so graceful and she was so gentle and so kind and so patient with us because we had a, you know, we had a small crew 
uh, I was lucky enough because I had uh, I, I did a show at the Park Armory, so they, I was lucky enough that so they lend us uh, their space to shoot. We had like you know uh, one day, and I, of course I was very ambitious as anybody who's want to be a director. I was like, oh, we're going to shoot you know this and this angle. It was ridiculous the amount of shots that I had. So thank God I had I was uh, working with. Um, a team of uh, DP and um, who she, two, two women who were fantastic, um, who helped me a lot. I think you would, I would have not been able to do so well if it was not for them. And our crew was essentially women. Uh, and so I think it, it helped in the way to, to, everybody was, you know, you were like a circle of trust and, um, and it was a fantastic experience. It was really good, and and it it was released as an intermission. So they usually do that when because the opera is um, shown also in HD worldwide. So when you have the intermission physically uh, at the opera, um, people, let's say in France, Poland, wherever, they go to a theater where they see the opera in the intermission. They show the film. So um, that was that was a fantastic experience, and you have other you know artists like you know Mauricio Catalan, you have you know Elizabeth Payton, others who did who did that type of work. So it was a fantastic experience. It was intense, but it was you know it was it was really lovely. Yeah. So I'm not I don't know how I would love to explore that again. I'm not sure how, um, because um, anything that involves imagery and expressing yourself differently. I think it's still very interesting, but uh, I, have, I have, let's say I have no plans yet. We'll see what the future reserves for me. <laughs> and, and you do have a background in film, which is something that I didn't know really until, I don't know, maybe a few years ago when I really started looking into your background, but that's, a, that's another part of your career, another part of your life. I have many lives. <laughs> I sound like I'm like 85 years old, but... <laughs> accomplished but, though in, in many in many areas yeah and I think also that's why I think it was it was uh, maybe that's also why I was quite ambitious when I started to do that film I was like oh, yeah of course I'm going to be shooting this and do a Francisco Ford Coppola no you're not but it was <laughs> it was it was really good and um and also to you know um to also speak about the graphic graphic novel and maybe add on to uh Brooks' uh, question, uh, when I was working in the movie business, I was a storyboard artist. So the idea of seeing and interpreting a, interpreting a story in 2D and in drawings, in a way, even though the format is much more intimidating because a graphic novel is a story, like storyboards are seen by the director, the producer, and obviously me. But a graphic novel obviously is going to be seen by other people so that's the inti intimidating part and that you know your drawings have to be a bit more polished but I think I had an advantage in a way of being able to tell a story in 2D which I think I also do in my paintings is that is that ability to uh, sum up something in a, mm -hmm. in non-moving images. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually haven't seen the Cinderella video. Is there anywhere online we can watch it? Or, or... Yeah, I, uh, the, ah, good. Yeah, if you go to the uh, Metropolitan Opera website, they do have something, but I think also I have it on my website. Ah, oh, good, okay, yeah. good. And I think actually Abby already put a link to your website in at least earlier on the chat. So we can, we can lead people in that direction. When we have just a few minutes left, if anyone has, we've got about five minutes left. If anyone, you know, has a last question for Elizabeth or a comment or something they'd like to share, please wave your hand or put it in the chat. We're happy to. Otherwise, I was going to honor the request that someone had to show a few, a little bit more of your work. Because uh, we do have a few slides that we're never able that we we haven't been able to get to in the presentation. If you if you don't mind, Elizabeth, maybe we could. Uh, my impulse is to talk about one that that we haven't. I think ever. Well, these are some really stunning drawings that go with writing places. Yeah. I don't know if you'd rather if you'd rather talk about your drawing process and and some of these. Oh, it's um, a to end with. 
I can I can do whatever you want. So I can I can I can absolutely talk about the drawing process. Usually, the drawing comes obviously before the painting, and um, I focused on the main character. And I want to because I want to see. And you know what's interesting is that in that painting, I thought at first that this is it. I'm not going to do the background. I'm just going to make ah. her and I'll make this giant painting of her with this giant horse. That was the idea. And then I thought the story needs to be bigger. And uh, that's when then I introduced, and then I thought about it. That's when I introduced all the, you know, the, the, the building story and I felt like it was more meaningful. But with that study particularly, it started with her and I really thought that was, that was gonna be big because I was inspired by all, you know, Reynolds or Gainsborough portrait where you have this thing where it's really centered on uh, usually the men and which is the center figure of, of the painting and almost life-size. So I thought maybe I could achieve that, but yeah. And, uh, and that technique is definitely steep into Angre idea of, you know, the drawing and really focusing on that. And these are, again, two studies that you know, hopefully in the next large scales watercolors, <laughs> we will see. And, um, and yeah, I mean, there's still, you still see um, the buildings. And again, it focuses on the character because I, I just want to know their interaction together and the space they will occupy. Uh, likely the paintings will still be bigger than this um, because um, depending depending on the layouts, the, yeah, the, the painting will still, I mean, there will be the, obviously the, the main character of the, of the work, but the paintings will, will show more of the building and their surroundings because I really want to put forward that they are all those landowners, right? And um, they are living in the stately home, so, and you have to see the stately home, so, yeah. I know these these characters have feel so contemporary to me. I don't know why, but I feel like they could be walking down the street or we see them in a in a cafe or something dining, even despite the, the really incredible sort of dresses and hats that they're wearing. Um, they feel like they're of the moment for sure. Yeah, and I think it, it, it goes also with the, the hair. I think there's something about mm, mm. Um, having this crown and be again unapologetic about it and not trying to modify it in a certain way and just let it be. So I think it makes it very present and now uh, in that way of you have more and more um, black women embracing their natural hair. So um, it makes them yeah more contemporary. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'll, if anyone has any last, we're getting a lot of thank yous for you. Oh. Um, and and wonderful work uh, oh, comments in the chat. So oh, make sure you yeah. make sure you look at the chat before you before you sign off, Elizabeth. You're getting lots of lots of kudos. So and thank you so much for being here with us. We we really really appreciate. I really really appreciate it. And um, oh, thank you for having. It was. I, I mean, I think it went by so fast. It always yes. does. I it does. <laughs> It does. And I feel bad because there's so much more. I mean, you know, we could talk about each of your paintings an hour or so. Yeah, I think we should do that next time. <laughs> okay, a marathon. <laughs> well, I loved Brooke's suggestion of a book release party when that graphic novel comes out. Um, yes. And I, I did want to mention that if anybody does, any artists on the call do want a little bit more, that there are just a few spots left for that master class that's this Friday. And I dropped a link to that in the chat. Um, but I also linked to Taking Space and we had someone who asked how long it's on view and it's on view until September 5th. So get your vaccinations and then go see, go see the show um, and reserve your ticket ahead of time. But huge thank you to Elizabeth and to Jody for your excellent moderations and questions. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much. And feel Thanks free to everybody. say goodbye on your way out. <laughs> really wonderful thank program, you. Abby.